Um, thank you for the time of, of CNE News and to Thermo Fisher for, for sponsoring the event. Uh, so, so really the focus of the talk today is to, to focus in on electronic materials. And I want to tell you a story about where these, this field has come and where it's going and some of the challenges that it's, it's going to be facing. And so this story really starts with the people in my life. And so for those of you that know me, you know that there are two constants in my life, Disney and chemistry. And I've always been surrounded by chemists because my brother and father are both chemists. By fate, I married a chemist and his father is also a chemist. But the impactful chemists in my life extend well beyond my immediate family, starting with my undergraduate advisor, Jocelyn Nadeau at Marist College, who not only introduced me to research, but introduced me to electronic materials because we were studying conducting polymers. And my graduate advisor, Will Dictel, who taught me how to contribute to a rapidly changing field, such as covalent organic frameworks, but doing so while maintaining scientific rigor. And now today, every day, I meet new colleagues at Dow DuPont that are scientists and engineers that are working at that forefront of electronic materials. But when we think about the forefront of electronic materials, that really ties back to my first passion, Disney. And if we were to take a closer look at Epcot Center and focus in on Spaceship Earth, that ride is all about communications through the years and how electronics has enabled them. And so we have to ask a question. Why do people communicate with each other? Ever since early man inscribed pictures on walls, people have been trying to communicate. And today, we take selfies and post them on our Insta stories. And it's really for the same reason. You're trying to say, I was here, I saw this, and I want you to experience it too. But there's a lot that has happened between what the human hand can impart to the world and shrinking that world so that it fits into the palm of the human hand. And I would say that electronics has really inspired that. And so when we reflect back on the electronics industry, we have to think about how far it's come. And if we focus in on that first computer, it had the form factor of an entire room, and it was this complex array of printed circuit boards that were wired together. But as the field progressed, we started to think about how do we impart the ability to put people on the go with these electronic devices. And in the 1970s, 1980s, you could see that the cell phone was introduced. And of course, it looks a little bit more like a piece of luggage as it sports its handle. But the idea was there, give people the ability to communicate on the go. And so in the field, we've gotten a little bit better at doing this. We've gotten quite a bit better at doing this. And we've had a really good roadmap to help us. And that's the idea of Moore's Law that tells us every year we can continue to shrink the size of these devices so that now they do fit comfortably in the palms of our hand, but at the same time, we could reduce the cost. And so now we're starting to get at the limit of how small we would actually want to make these devices. And now we're starting to think about moving beyond this device. How do we make these electronics connect us to each other and to this smart world that we live in? And so when I think about these devices, the very first thing I think about is how do we power them, right? Let's face it, we just don't have time to sit at home tethered to our electrical outlets. And this is what I focused on in graduate school. How do we take these batteries of the past, these large lead acid batteries, and now shrink the amount of uh, footprint while maintaining that level of energy density. And so we decided to use covalent organic frameworks, or COFs, to accomplish this. And so COFs are very high surface area crystalline polymers. And so the idea was to use that high surface area to pack a lot of ions and therefore store a lot of charge but we could also use the power of organic chemistry to tune those sidewalls with redox active groups. And this would further increase the amount of energy that we could store. And so during graduate school, we went through several iterations of this material. 
And ultimately, we were able to take the material from its precursors in Sigma Aldrich bottles all the way through to making a supercapacitor that could, in fact, illuminate an LED in a matter of seconds. And so thinking about the chemistry of how to power these electronics really set me up well to go into the electronics industry, where at Dow DuPont, we focus in on these devices and think about all of the chemistry at every single level of the device. And so what I want to do now is focus in on this printed circuit board, which might be one of the most overlooked layers in our electronics. But it's actually the layer that not only imparts the structural integrity of the device, but actually allows for the connections between each of the other layers. And so if we were to go look at our printed circuit boards, they look very familiar and they might look really simple. But if we were to take a closer look, we'll see that we have, in fact, a really heterogeneous and complex substrate. And that's best illustrated by starting to look at these copper inner layers. And what we need to understand is that these inner layers are the actual circuitry of the device. This is what's telling our device how to work. But what you'll also notice is that those inner layers are embedded in a sea of resin and glass material. So this is also insulating material. So we have to ask a question. How do we get electronic communication between these copper inner layers so that our device can actually work. And so what we're going to do is actually use a very complex multi-step process that actually takes really complex equipment to even accomplish. But what we're going to do is focus in on the chemistry of this process. And so you can take these eight or nine steps of metallization chemistry and divide them into three distinct parts. We have a cleaning step that goes in towards cleaning those copper inner layers, an activation step, which looks at preparing that surface for catalyst deposition, and then ultimately a plating step, which is where we deposit a metal to actually make electrical connections between those copper inner layers. And so the chemistry that's involved here is very textbook basic fundamentals from general chemistry. We have oxidations, we have electrostatic interactions, and we have redox chemistry that deposits the metal on that surface, making those layers talk to each other. But while we focus in on the chemistry of this process, we can't lose sight of the importance of the physical heterogeneity and roughness of these substrates. And so it turns out that the rough nature of these woven glass epoxies is the way that we have adhesion between the, those metal wires and the underlying dielectric substrate. And so what this boils down to is a reliable device that will work for a long time. But now we're starting to ask more of our devices. We want them to be faster. And ultimately what this means is we move to new substrates that are very smooth and typically non-reactive. And so you might be wondering, well, why are we actually moving towards these new substrates? And to best illustrate that, we should think about the fifth generation of wireless, or 5G. And so in general, wireless generations has to do with the rate at which data is transferred in our devices. And so practically what this means to you and me is that if we were to download a movie in 2, 2G or 3G, it might take several hours. But in 5G, this would take two seconds. And so the, the next question that you might have is what does this have to do with adhesion and roughness? And to understand that, we need to take another closer look at those copper lines and think about how this electric signal is being transmitted through those lines. And it turns out that when you're at lower frequency applications, the bulk of that electric signal is actually transferred through the bulk of the copper. So it does not need to see the roughness of that dielectric. But once we get to higher frequency applications, now that electron density is forced to reside at the interface. And so ultimately what this means is that any imperfection or roughness in that dielectric 
will cause a slowdown of that signal. And so you might be thinking, well, the natural way to get around this is to make this surface very smooth. And that's true. That's one way that we can think about accomplishing this. But if we do that, now we've lost our mechanism of adhesion. And so we can now take this problem and turn it back to a chemistry problem. Because now we can design new dielectrics that have increased chemical affinity for those metal lines that are residing on top of them. And once we accomplish this, then we're going to be able to say goodbye to these very frustrating lines of the past, whether they're the telephone lines or just standing in line at the coffee shop. Because we're going to be given back time in our day. We're going to be able to say hello to this idea of the Internet of Things, where now we could remove that line at the coffee shop by using electronic pay. Or we're going to be given back an hour of our commute because now we have autonomous vehicles. We're going to have wearable electronics that are embedded with an array of sensors that help connect us to our health and to our healthcare providers. We're going to be better connected to the nutrients in our food and to the people that grow it. We're going to be better connected to our communities and to the smart cities with which we live and then ultimately, just like Connor was talking about earlier today, we're going to take this data that we get, and now we have the, the way of feeding it back into artificial intelligence. And we're going to be able to use that to design the next generation of advances. And so it's really easy to get caught up in how technology is going to make our lives better and faster and more efficient. But it's really important to not lose sight of the people that are driving each of these innovations. And it's really up to the innovator to craft what that picture of tomorrow is going to look like. And so this reminds me of a quote from Albert Einstein. Life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. And so with that, I thank you for your attention, and I would welcome any questions. <laughs>